Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Marina Kallurand. I'm the chair of the Global Commission on Stability Cyberspace, and I think that we are ready to start. We were informed by the organizers that we have to finish by 2.45 in order to get to the main room to listen to President Macron. Uh, with my colleagues, I just came from uh, the panel which was organized by the Paris Peace Forum, which was discussing the, Par the, the Paris call. And it was good to know that today there are 51 countries, 93 civil society organizations, and more than 200 private sector actors who have already endorsed the Paris call. And I'm really proud that our commission is among those from civil society and our commission was involved in the work and once again I'd like to congratulate France on wonderful, wonderful endeavor and for having such a wide support. For me the Paris call maybe is, the, is a very important document because of the multi-stakeholder model, multi-stakeholder multi approach. It is advertising, it is paying attention to, and I hope that from a political document, it will soon be a working document, and when we meet a year later, we can have best practices of multi-stakeholder approach and model. And having said that, as you see, we have commissioners, at the table, we have our advisors, our supporters in the audience, and I'd like to invite my co-chair, Michael Chertov, to introduce the work of our commission, and then we go to the norms that we're going to propose. Michael, please. Thank you, Marina. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and we're delighted to be part of the proceedings here. Um, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background about the commission and what we've done and what we propose to talk about today. Uh, the commission was launched in 2017 at the Munich Security Conference, and the idea was to focus on the norms and policies that promote security and stability in cyberspace. So, uh, obviously, there are a lot of issues to discuss with the internet, but we felt that security and stability of cyberspace as a whole was something that required attentiveness. And part of the design of the commission was to bring not just government, but private actors and civil society into the dialogue about how to preserve stability. The idea here is that unlike uh, the traditional notion with respect to international norms that they are largely government driven, Given the nature of cyberspace and given the fact that much of the actual operational activity is in private hands, there has to be a multi-stakeholder approach. It has to be not just government, it has to be the private sector and civil society as well. In, in composing the commission, <clears throat> we try to reflect this. The 28 commissioners who've been part of this include people with uh, technical expertise and background, academics, former government officials, uh, the idea being that they would bring a wide variety of perspectives to the challenges that we are addressing. It's been sponsored initially by the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, which together with the East-West Institute provided staffing for the Secretariat and for organizing um, our activities logistically. In addition, to further broaden the inputs from a wider variety of stakeholders, we set up a research group and included sponsors that could be involved in the process of doing research and helping us execute the mission of the commission. The idea being, again, we want to have the broadest input from around the world. We've met for approximately four times a year, and the idea has been to develop, and as we'll describe, uh, lay out proposed norms for state behavior and, frankly, for non-state behavior. And the reason that non-state behavior is important, again, is because so much of what occurs operationally uh, is in private hands. So it's not just a question of a government monopoly on, on what happens on the internet. Our purpose here today in part is to get feedback from you 
to refine what we have laid out and will describe as the key principles for security and stability, and to talk about what are the things that stakeholders need to do going forward. So we hope this will be a constructive dialogue. We hope you will find our norms to be uh, sensible and compelling, but we also want to hear your feedback. And so with that, let me turn it back to Marina. Uh, Michael, thank you. And now we'll proceed the following way. Today we will introduce, we have the kind of a soft launch of norm package, we call it Singapore, because we agreed it more or less in Singapore, we had to do some fine tuning of the Singapore, but we call it the Singapore package. We'll come to that. But to start with, I would like to start with the first norm that we adopted almost a year ago, and which we proposed was the call to protect the public core of the internet. And Wolfgang, please. Thank you, Marina. Oh, I'm sorry. I think that the easiest way is to that we introduce the norms, all of them, and then we start discussion so that we will have time to talk about all norms that are of interest to you. Thank you. Welcome, please. Uh, thank you, Marina. Uh, when we started to work in the Commission, we realized that um, there are, is a certain hierarchy in the norms. Uh, there are norms which has really a very general and universal value, and there are other norms which have more a specific meaning for a specific sector. And in today's world, I think everything is dependent from the functioning of the internet. So I think our national security is today cybersecurity. The, our national economy is a digital economy. And you know, rights are online and offline more uh, or less the same. And in so far, it was very natural to say, you know, if we want to have a stability in the cyberspace, we have to have a very secure and stable core of the internet. Because if the internet does not function, this undermines the security of everybody, this undermines the economy of all countries. And in so far, to have a, a norm which protect the public core of the internet is the key element also for, uh, for all things. We had a long discussion, you know, how we define the public core of the internet. In essence, it's uh, the naming and numbering system, it's the forwarding system, and, you know, the uh, three lines of the norm are uh, very simple, uh, which says, you know, uh, state and non-state actors should not conduct or knowingly allow activities that intentionally and substantially damage the general avail availability or integrity of the public core of the internet and therefore the stability of cyberspace. And, you know, we include there the routing domain name system, certificates and trust and communication cables. So with other words, more or less, this is uh, the, 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 the protection of the critical resources of the internet, which are managed by ICANN. Uh, ICANN has its own security and stability committee, but we have seen in the last couple of years um, ongoing attacks against the root server system, against other elements of ICANN, and this should be very clearly defined as um, crime, as a crime against humanity if somebody brings the, uh, the public core of the internet down. And so far, you know, this is a very specific norm which uh, should be universally recognized, and not only by states, but also by non-state actors, because a lot of attacks against the systems are uh, coming from non-state actors. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Wolfgang. And maybe I just add one thing, that it's a living document. When we published it, we had definition where we said that elements of the public core include inter alia, internet routing, the domain name system, certificates and trust, and communication cables. After Bill and Olaf had very extensive consultations with the IT community, we developed that definition further so that in the handouts you can see uh, the definition of the public core as we see today. And again, I'd like to stress all of these are living documents. So we are looking for your feedback and are very happy to hear about your opinions. Having said that, I'll pass floor to Marietia and we'll talk about uh, electoral systems norms. Norm. 
Thank you so much, Marina. And uh, I add my uh, appreciation for everyone who's here. And it's also really nice to have such a huge delegation of uh, us from the council on the podium. I guess it's the best way to stand between you and Macron. Uh, but we'll let you go in time. Um, in my daily life, I'm a member of the European Parliament. And so the whole right to, uh, to vote for people as a universal human right, uh, voting by secret ballot, and um, uh, according to you know, his or her um, uh, wish of electing a government by universal suffrage is, I think, a very, very important uh, human right. And I'm sure you've noticed uh, heated debate recently about various elements of the integrity of democracy and elections, including disinformation, which is getting a lot of headlines and uh, discussion on social media. Um, but what we've tried to do is really look at the sort of deeper layer of electoral integrity in the context of our looking for suggest suggesting norms that multiple stakeholders can get behind. Um, because we, we come from a point in time where the risk of uh, fragmentation and conflict uh, and uh, disintegration of the global open internet is very significant, but where norms, where multiple stakeholders can gravitate around are really missing, even though the rights that are at stake and the principles that are at stake are so significant. So in order to look at the other dimension, the more technologically driven dimension of uh, the electoral process, we are suggesting a norm that says, and it's projected right there, state and non-state actors should not pursue, support or allow cyber operations intended to disrupt the technical infrastructure essential to elections, referenda and plebiscites. And this on the one hand builds on this universal human right to uh, uh, elect, on the other hand it builds on the, on the core principle of the UN Charter Article 2.4 uh, the principle of non-interference. And we're, we're basically extending that to the uh, electoral infrastructure. So we've, we've really tried to anchor this norm, as we do with all norms, in agreed, universally adopted principles, so that we're not suggesting something that's sort of out there, but that we're bringing it close to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and in this case, the UN Charter. So I hope that's clear, happy to answer more questions, but I know you'll be hearing a lot more from uh, my colleagues, so I'll, I'll leave it at this, thanks. Thank you, Marietje. I perhaps needed to say how proud we are that the norm was also reflected in the Paris call. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and having said that, now we're moving to the, to the package that we are happy to introduce today. The packages are in the room and you can receive them from our Secretariat, the Singapore Norm Package. And first I'd like to give floor to Bill to introduce the norm to avoid tampering. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, Scott Charney of Microsoft was the uh, principal author of this one, and so I'm afraid uh, I'm not as well prepared to discuss it as he would have been, but uh, I will do my best. So. This one is, uh, as opposed to our main norm, which is about actions against the core of the internet, this one is looking at the indirect effects of actions taken against products. So when someone attacks a router in the internet or attacks a domain name in the internet, that's a direct attack and it's a very easily visible one. When someone compromises a router by diverting it while it's being shipped to its customer and installing wiretap gear, or they compromise the encryption protocols that are used for management communication with that equipment, um, these are indirect attacks that set up later damage. And, uh, sorry. Um, let me just, uh, is this better? Sorry about that. Um, so this is an indirect attack that sets up later attacks. It's often used, uh, military people will talk about it as pre-positioning an attack. Um, so th there are many obvious problems with people doing this. It's a compromise and rarely is the person who puts the compromise in place 
the first or the only one to abuse it. Uh, so that's the first big problem. The other one is that it destroys the trust between the people who use these products to build the internet and the vendors that they depend upon to build the products. If they can't trust that the thing that they get from the vendor has not been tampered with, isn't compromised, one of the foundational building blocks is gone. And in an industry where we have to continue doubling in size every 10 and a half months, the supply chain has to move very quickly. It's large and it moves quickly. When we can't trust it, there's no clear, no clear answer, no clear solution. So that's what this norm is really aimed at. It's at the kinds of governmental attacks that undermine the products that we build the internet from, um, both hardware and software. Thanks. More questions later, I guess. Uh, thank you, Bill. And from here, we're moving to norm against commander commandeering of ICT devices into botnets. And Olaf, please. So the, uh, the way that this norm came about was a discussion around um, IoT. That's at least how it started. We are shipping product into the homes, and even if we, they might not have been tempered with uh, or tainted in the production uh, 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 chain, they might still contain bugs which are exploitable. Um, and having uh, uh, millions and millions of uh, devices in our environment, in our personal life, or or in our well, in our in our cities, in our in our in our schools, in our homes, um, with those vulnerabilities, and seeing those turned into uh, uh, and weaponized um, uh, is is a concern. So that was sort of the uh, uh, inspiration for for this uh, this 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 norm. Um, now, it is unrealistic, unfortunately, to say this should never be done. Nobody should ever hack a, uh, I, uh, a, a, a an IoT device and not use it in, uh, for, for any, any nefarious purposes. Because, um, uh, f frankly, state actors sometimes depend on ICTs to, uh, to, uh, to, to create attacks. And... Um, uh, saying you're not allowed to do that uh, will not get the uh, buy-in from, uh, from, from the people that we actually want the buy-in of, uh, states for instance. So we were very careful to look for language that says, uh, w which indicates proportionality. Um, and if you look at the text, uh, uh, more or less in the description text, we talk about en masse. And we believe that botnets are exactly the type of thing, the type of thing that we want to avoid, that indicate that, that, uh, that, that en masse feature of the attack and the type of attack that will um, um, uh, create instability for uh, not just the place where uh, the attack is launched, uh, not the individual, say, home or environment where the, 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 the botnet is, is created, but for the larger internet. Commandeering is another word of art in this, in this context. Commandeering is uh, actually using uh, uh, the device without the, uh, without the knowledge of the user and for, for the nefarious purposes. Um, so that's what led us to create this norm as state and non-state actors should not commandeer other ICT resources, so very broad, not only uh, IoT, for use as botnets, things at scale, or for similar purposes, because botnets are not the only type of attacks uh, which are at scale. And we wanted to keep this open-ended in that sense. Uh, thank you, Olaf. And now we're going to two norms that will be introduced by Chris. First, the norm for states to create a vulnerability equities processes and norm to reduce and mitigate significant vulnerabilities. Thank you, Marina. Please, please. Uh, so uh, this norm is meant to, uh, to address something where we've already seen some good activity. Uh, the, the basic issue is that governments, uh, through a number of different means, may come into possession of unknown, uh, un publicly known, vulnerabilities. And those vulnerabilities can be used for a number of purposes, including for law enforcement, intelligence, and other purposes, but they also uh, it might be much more important to disclose those vulnerabilities because that would lead to 
uh, greater security of the overall ecosystem. And that's a balance uh, that as you're looking at these, you know, I don't expect governments to release every vulnerability they find because they need them for law enforcement and other purposes, and they'd argue, I think, and there's a fair argument that that also enhances stability when they can use them to go after online criminal groups and others. However, uh, we thought, you know, we, you know, we think that you need to go through that balance. And that balance can't just be the people or the law enforcement and intelligence people. It has to include all the different stakeholders in governments, which include, among others, uh, the people who do uh, other aspects of internet policy, uh, who do commercial policy, et cetera. Now, the United States came up with the vulnerabilities equities process uh, a couple of years ago, and they refined it again in the last year, which is uh, tries to create a transparent process. It's never going to be transparent about the individual decisions, but it's transparent in terms of who participates and what the procedures are. Uh, and expressly made, uh, I think this was a huge move, that the default presumption would be disclosure. And that's what our norm does too. It says states should create procedurally transparent frameworks to assess whether and when to disclose not publicly known vulnerabilities or flaws they are aware of in information systems and technologies. And Importantly, the default presumption should be in favor of disclosure. So this recognizes that some will be withheld, but that default of disclosure for network security and other and privacy and other purposes is important. Uh, we've seen a number of other governments begin to also look at this. Uh, I think Canada, um, uh, the UK, and others around the world. That's a good thing. We don't expect every government to have the same vulnerabilities equities process, but have it spread so this is a best practice I think helps the overall stability of the internet in toto. So that, that's the purpose of that one. Next. Now, this norm, the norm to reduce and mitigate significant vulnerabilities, uh, we've had some discussion about norms of restraint uh, for different actors, including uh, the one that dealt with uh, a norm of restraint, essentially, that actors should not do anything that would essentially uh, affect the supply chain and the manufacturer uh, of devices that would undercut the stability in a substantial way of the internet. Uh, this is almost a companion piece. This is, look, uh, there is the affirmative putting into uh, products vulnerabilities, but there's also, and I think we're all recognizing this or cognizant of this, there's lots of vulnerabilities in those products now, and they're not necessarily there intentionally. They're there for lots of different reasons. They're there for, because of the code is being very complex. It's difficult to get them all out. Uh, and what we're trying to do through this norm is say, look, everyone has a responsibility, including the developers of products and services on which the stability of cyberspace depends to take action to prioritize security and to make sure to the maximum extent possible that those vulnerabilities are not there. That that would too uh, contribute to the overall stability of cyberspace. So this one reads developers and producers of products and services on which the stability of cyberspace depends should prioritize security and stability take reasonable steps to ensure that their products or services are free from significant vulnerabilities and take measures to timely mitigate vulnerabilities that are later discovered and be transparent about their process. Before I get to the rest of that norm, let's, let me just point out a couple of things. One, it's uh, a expectation they'll both take action to make sure the vulnerabilities are not there, but because we know they may be there anyway, that when they discover them, they take quick action to solve them, um, and they take those, those reasonable steps to do that. Uh, so those things together are important. And then when they do disclose that or when they work with other stakeholders, they do it in a transparent way. And then the last part of this norm is that all actors, not just manufacturers and producers, but all actors have a duty to share information on vulnerabilities in order to help prevent and mitigate malicious cyber activity uh, more generally. Uh, so those coupled together, I think, helps create a more secure ecosystem in preventing vulnerabilities being out there. The vulnerabilities equities process deals with disclosing them, and some of our other norms deal with other aspects of it. it as a package, they hang together. Uh, thank you, Chris. And to continue, uh, Henriette, will, Henriette will introduce the norm on basic cyber hygiene as foundational defense. Henriette, please. Um, thanks, Marina. And this norm was developed or led, uh, development was led by Commissioner Jane Hall Lute, and I'll attempt to, to present it. You can see how we work as a commission. Um, um, the idea is that defense is vital and that, and that digital security, digital safety, and cyber hygiene is a very important component of, of defense. Um, as a commission, we see security as a continuous process with responsibilities distributed among all actors and mechanisms. Um, 
And we also feel that automated reporting and information sharing on digital security, digital safety, and the use of it is very important. So essentially what this norm is advocating for is widespread adoption of cyber hygiene or digital safety or security, whatever language you use, measures at an institutional level, um, and also widespread capacity building to enable more safe secure use at end user level and also at, at an institutional level. It's not intended to make individuals responsible for their own security. I think it shouldn't be read that, that, that cybersecurity is your responsibility as an individual user, but it's saying that there is a relationship. There is a relationship between the end user level, the institutional level, and ensuring that there are sufficient measures in place. To, to, to protect users from, from, from um, malicious attacks, from malware, from, from viruses, um, and from um, violation of their, or, or of, their, of their secure communications. And to conclude the introductory section, I'm really happy to give floor to Frederick. Frederick, it's so good to be in Paris again, and please. The, your, the norm against offensive side operations by non-state actors. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here too. Um, so this is a norm to prevent non-state actors to engage in cyber operations, but also to um, have state actors prevent and respond to such activities if they occur. And uh, before I present the norm, I'd like to thank Ogeri and Francois Delrue who uh, helped drafting this norm and they're outside the commission, but they were precious. So, of course, um, cyber operations, because of their speed and ubiquity, very often pose um, difficulties to the state's judicial system and international law enforcement operations. But despite that, um, state sovereignty remains the cornerstone of the international system of peace and security. And as a corollary to their sovereignty, uh, states have rights and they have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force, which is strictly bound by international law, but they have also duties and responsibilities um, and um, particularly the principle of due diligence, meaning that states are obliged not to knowingly allow their territories to be used for acts that are contrary to the rights of other states. And these two principles uh, really guided the elaboration of these norms. So why do we do this norm? Because there are some non-state actors and prim mainly private companies that do advocate for the right to conduct offensive cyber operations across national borders. And sometimes they claim that it's in self-defense uh, or that states don't have uh, the capacity to adequately pro protect them against cyber threats. Um, sometimes they refer to uh, these uh, practices as active cyber defense because they consider that they conduct them for defensive purpose, so that includes, but it's not limited to hackback. And we find also that some states are unable to control or they just decide to ignore uh, these practices. Uh, and even though in most states those practices would be unlawful, if not criminalized, there are other states that appear to be neither uh, prohibiting them or neither explicitly authorizing them. So. And, and we've also seen that a few states have proposed legislation to allow offensive operations by non-state actors in their domestic um, legislation. So we believe that um, these practices are likely to undermine the security and the stability of cyberspace, and they can provoke uh, serious disruption and damages. They can also trigger very complex international legal disputes and potentially uh, conflict escalation. So we think that if states were to authorize explicitly the conduct of, so of s offensive cyber operations by non-state actors, it would set a very dangerous precedent and in many cases would breach international law. So we uh, believe that offensive measures should, should be reserved solely to states. Um, and that international law also establishes a very strict and exclusive framework for international responses to hostile ha acts, and that applies to cyber operations as well. Now, of course, you might have states who might decide occasionally to involve non-state actors, um, 
and ask them to act on their behalf. But in that cases, um, they must be considered as their agents and therefore they're considered an extension of the state. And in addition, we think uh, that states must act both domestically and internationally to prevent offensive cyber operations by non-state actors. So to be clear, uh, states should prohibit such conducts in their domestic uh, legislation, meaning that if a state grants such possibilities to a non-state actor, um, then it may lead to a violation of its international obligations, particularly the principle of due um, diligence. And therefore, in such a situation, the state could be considered responsible uh, for allowing the conduct of offensive operations by non-state actors. Uh, and states also have to enforce this norm, meaning to respond. And that could be, for example, to sanction the domestic non-state actors that conduct uh, offensive cyber operations. But they also need um, to cooperate internationally to investigate these events. Thank you, Frederic. So those are the eight norms that we are proposing for consideration. Six in the Singapore, so-called Singapore package, and two from before public core of internet and electoral systems. We are sometimes accused of being a norms factory. Maybe we can agree to some extent, but what our commission has tried to do, we, we have tried to see what are the real problems in real life that we have to address when we see that states at the moment are not discussing very much the questions of substance, states are discussing their resolutions and what should be the next way forward in the United Nations, whether GG or open-ended working group, today we know that both, but how are they going to work, what will be there? So I think that in that situation, multi-stakeholders and our commission has a unique role. We're not going to replace anybody in the first committee or in other organizations but we can contribute to the discussion and we can keep the discussion going on and hope to continue it also in other forums. Are we going to do any additional norms? Well, I can't say 100% no, because Chris hates that, but let's be honest and open among friends. Because we are discussing also artificial intelligence. So maybe one of the norms we might propose might be artificial intelligence, but that will be somewhere next year. And then it's nine. Maybe we should consider 10. It's a nice number. So, but, <laughs> but, but, but let's say that majority of norm making has been done. So this is an outreach event. And before I open it to the public, I have already a couple of persons who have registered. And please catch my eye so that I can give floor to others. And first, I'd like to introduce Mr. Olivier Crepin Leblon, Chair of European at Large Organization of ICANN. Right in front, thank you very much. Is this working? I yep. know it. And you have to speak very, very closely. Um, yes, thank you very much for, for the floor. I'm gonna be very brief, uh, because I'd like to actually hear from all the people around the room. I'd like to hear, from, I really need to speak straight into it, goodness. I'd like to speak to all the, um, I'd like to hear more about all the people around the room who, who have uh, uh, watched uh, the presentation of these norms. I'm, I'm quite excited about this. I'm quite excited for a couple of reasons. The first one being that um, if you're going to uh, address a topic, you first have to address a norm that um, is the sort of the standard, box standard, wh wh what should be around, what the best practice is when it comes down to this topic. Evolving a lot in ICANN, um, uh, many of the times in working groups, the first thing we're being told is, okay, define this term, define that term, and if there's no definition for it, then you really don't know what you're, what you're talking about, or at least in legal terms, it starts to make it a little bit uh, uh, difficult. So I'm quite happy to see that now you are addressing, uh, I would say, various different component aspects of the internet from the, the, the core of the internet itself, but also down to cybersecurity, to all the cyber warfare and all the topics that we keep on hearing about, but there's no real definition for them uh, as such. I can't see a world policeman uh, dealing with enforcing these norms. But that being said, this is the internet. This is where name and shame actually works where you can communicate 
anyone that doesn't actually adhere to, to these things. And you can evaluate and you can go further once you've got it defined. And the fact that you've defined it is already the first step in being able to actually say, wait a minute, you are not adhering to this. You're, you're not following this. What are you doing? Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled about this. I think it's just the beginning. I hope that you're going to continue, perhaps not even adding more norms, but then thinking about what you're going to do next after that. And the very, the very fact that we're discussing this here, um, the, the group of us here, and there's so many people in the room and so on, is a good start. Um, and I'll just let others speak after that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Olaf has a two finger. Yeah, the way that I uh, like to think about this is that we uh, put down a vision, uh, a, a place to end up with. Um, I do think that uh, you, you say the internet is a place of name and shame. I do not know whether that is sufficient for um, transparency is Im important in this, in this aspect. Um, when we want to keep people accountable, um, states specifically, uh, name and shame might not be the only instrument in the toolbox. Um, as a commission, we have identified, I think, I think that's fair to say that this is an issue that we need to further discuss. What are the accountability? What are the transparency mechanisms that are available specifically to states um, that allow responding without further escalation? Ariette? Sorry, my, my, my two fingers here. Um, well, firstly, we really do want feedback, and it's amazing to see all these people, the ICANN board members, people from the technical community, civil society, government, so we want you to comment. I just want to say that the, the public no core norm is different, I think, from the other norms, and I think you should keep that in mind when you respond. And the public core norm is not just about the behavior that, we, that we're trying to advocate for. It also implies an understanding of the internet and of the core of the internet being a public, common resource that we have to have stewardship over. And I think, therefore, it's very important to think of that norm as being more than just a norm. It's actually suggesting a way for us as an internet governance community to think about this core common part of the internet. So just wanted to emphasize that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrietta. I know everyone wants to say already something. So, but we came here to listen, yeah? So let's go back. Let's go back to the audience. Let's listen to the interventions. And after that, everybody will have a chance to reflect on, uh, on uh, what has been said. And I'll go to the second speaker, also from ICANN, Sarah Deutsch, board member of ICANN, please. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm very pleased to be able to join you uh, today on behalf of ICANN and share a few high-level thoughts and congratulate you on a very interesting and valuable discussion so thus far. I think it's very important for the, com the Commission to hear from a wide array of different stakeholders. And as you know, ICANN is just one of many different actors who make up the Internet governance space, uh, although like others, we are potentially affected by the Commission's work. So just as you raised, the, uh, we were very interested to read about the publication of the public core norm um, and uh, when it was first published in 2017. And then some of my colleagues in the room here actually were able to participate in the September meeting you had in Singapore. Uh, so the definition of public core in the draft of earlier this year included the operation of the domain name system and it included registries and name servers and processes such as DNSSEC. Uh, and uh, as you know, all these operations are squarely within ICANN's remit, so we are very interested and want to engage in discussions as this moves forward. Um, ICANN, uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate, it, uh, is a multi-stakeholder organization, and so we value the work uh, and we note that this work has been based on inputs from a wide variety of stakeholders as well, so we feel that also reflects a multi-stakeholder model and that this kind of deliberation on governance of cyberspace really makes sense rather than a narrower, multilateral approach. Um, and in, in our highly connected world, having that multilateral approach is really a, a more sensible solution than uh, mandating a, a, you know, a single group of stakeholders uh, to figure out how governance should evolve. Uh, so 
the evolution of uh, the proposed norm on the public core is also relevant to the current discussions that some of you may be aware of at ICANN about the effects of GDPR on ICANN, including the WHOIS services. Um, and WHOIS services, because of GDPR, have changed as a result of European legislation. So the reason why I'm raising this is, um, you know, ICANN has taken its own work to assess where the legislative initiatives are, are headed and policies and whether national regional or global uh, models uh, will affect the stability, security, and the interoperability of the domain name system. You may find yourself thinking about this issue as well. And as we found with GDPR, even well-intentioned uh, laws and regulations can have unintended consequences. So that's, that's why we're flagging that. Um, and in this case, because of the redaction of personal data from the WHOIS system. Um, in the same vein, we were recently involved in current deliberations taking place at the ITU plenipotentiary in Dubai, where proposals are also being debated that could affect ICANN's mission. So uh, just to sum up, we look forward to further dialogue uh, along these lines today and our continued involvement in the important work of this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as you know, one of the commissioners is Vice President Scott Ciani from Microsoft. And we have always felt support of Microsoft, not pushing, but very nice, soft support. And I'm really happy to give floor to Jan, our good friend. And uh, Thanks very much, Marina. Um, and on behalf of Microsoft, let me congratulate uh, the commission on adopting the, the Singapore norms package. I think um, we have witness an evolution in, in, in the Commission's work and, and, and deliverables over the last year and a half. And uh, from our perspective, we, we have been an early supporter and tried, tried to be supportive of the work of the Commission because, frankly, it is, it is a very important um, set, set of inputs that you're able to generate. What, what I would say is, uh, you know, we, we live in a world where not only do we see over 350,000 new types of malware being generated every day. We're also in a world where we have over 30 governments that have developed offensive capabilities in cyberspace. And so getting to a place where we, we have robust governance and robust rules that govern the behavior um, of, of those uh, nations as well as private sector actors in, in this space is really important uh, to us and I think increasingly to our industry. Um, and what I would uh, say is that one of the things that would be terrific to see is that the great content that you all are generating finds its way eventually into other fora and other processes, uh, such as, for example, the, the Paris call that uh, President Macron will formally unveil in, in just about an hour um, that does reflect already a couple of the norms that you, you all developed. And it's great to see um, the connection there and, and, the, and the impact, frankly, of the work of the Commission. But I would encourage the Commission to also maybe think about other um, uh, for and other processes that you can also guide, as you, as you mentioned, not in a competitive manner, but thinking about the content and the work that's generated here to help steer uh, processes like the newly emerging uh, group of government experts at the UN, like the work in the G7 and the G20, so there's a lot of runway, I think, for, for the work of the Commission to, to really have, have an impact over time. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jan. And I'd like to give a floor to another good friend of our Commission, uh, Jean, please, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, Marina. Um, um, merci beaucoup à tous. Uh, je sais qu'il n'y a pas de traduction, donc je vais parler en anglais. Même si nous sommes à l'UNESCO et que la francophonie est un, est un axe important d'effort de, de cette organisation. Uh, so France is a, a very important supporter of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace since the beginning, and I would like to uh, to really uh, thank you and congratulate you on uh, on behalf of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, with regards to the the great work that you've done and on the Singapore Norms Package just released today. Um, obviously, we've been following very closely all the work done by the, the Commission over the last uh, almost two years now, um, and uh, we, are, we are very glad to see that a lot of the, the hope that we had put in this Commission are, are starting to, to bear fruit because we're really looking at you as a way to, to develop norms that uh, were not necessarily um, easily 
formulated by state only in uh, state negotiations. So we thought that uh, this uh, commission was a good complementary way to develop also new ideas and uh, make uh, other voices heard at the international level. And I think that's really what you managed to do uh, with uh, this uh, great group of commissioners coming from different uh, strands of uh, life and former experiences with uh, former people from government, people from the technical committee, people from civil society at large. And, and you managed to make those different voices heard and create a, a package of them that is quite balanced because it addresses um, both the responsibility of state and non-state actors, and as well as uh, some uh, of also every individual citizens and, uh, and the technical uh, community as such. So this is a, a very important work, and, uh, and we, we, we wish to reiterate our support. Uh, our support both to the method that you're following, this multi-stakeholder approach, and also on the, the principles that uh, lead the, the content of these norms. Um, as you are well aware, and as has been reflected in previous speakers, uh, the French president will formally uh, launch the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace this afternoon. And I think that indeed those two, uh, this initiative is very complementary to yours. And uh, uh, a lot of your ideas have infused within our, our text that is also your text because you've really contributed to, uh, to improving it uh, with a lot of different uh, stakeholders, including Microsoft and a lot of people and entities and countries represented in this room. And I want to really thank all the stakeholders that have been um, involved in this initiative to, to improve and to give more visibility to this text. That uh, it is our hope will uh, give a new visibility to this topic and will create some uh, momentum to advance on a number of those topics that are haven't been, uh, um, haven't been dealt with enough at a high political level. So um, now these norms, they need to live, they need to be uh, accepted, they need to be respected, they need to be owned by each and uh, every actor that is uh, involved in them. And we are really looking forward for the, for the next trend of work of the Commission, looking at the future and how we can articulate these norms with uh, more general governance mechanism and enforcement mechanism to make sure those uh, the norms are uh, well diffused and uh, owned and respected by each actor. Thank you very much. Uh, Jean, thank you very much. And now I open the floor and I have gentlemen here and gentlemen there and gentlemen there. Yes, please. And could you please also introduce yourself? Um, Pindawong, Hong Kong. Thank you very much for this presentation. An observation and a question, if I may. Uh, first of all, the observation with respect to the presentation of the norms. I thought it was very clever that uh, the way that you presented them in the sense that, you know, we, 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 we recall the internet is made up of layers of protocols. So the, the way that you've, in some sense, layered your norms so that the ones that are lower in the, that relate to the physical or hardware side obviously has ramifications above. I think that's a very clever way of future, uh, sort of presenting these norms that, that is digestible to all of us. The question I have is really um, beyond the layering of norms that reflects the layering of protocols, is really the question of incentives. So what is the incentives for countries to, countries or actors in this space to incentivize um, to conform to these norms and in the events that there are breach, that those are recognized and that the feedback mechanisms are in place for the stability of the ecosystems? Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Gentlemen over there, please. Thank you. Josh Gold with both the Canadian and Estonian Internet Societies. Um, it seems like these norms transcend the so-called free internet versus cyber sovereignty debate, focusing on things that are in the interest of all regardless of polit politics. While developing these, these, did you run into any liberal versus illiberal problems? Uh, I understand that the point was to be able, apolitical, but uh, were there any attempts to build norms that you ultimately could not agree, up, agree upon? Thanks. Thank you. Gentlemen, next to you, please, and then we go. Yeah, um, my name is Siva Subramanian. I'm from Internet Society India Chennai chapter. On the call to protect the public core of uh, the internet, uh, the focus uh, is probably on protecting the technical core of the internet and the infrastructure. And uh, isn't it more important also to protect the core values, the way the, way the internet works and uh, what makes the internet what it is? And so that sh should, sh shouldn't that also be included as part of the uh, uh, pursuit of protecting the core of the internet. Not only the technical core, but al also the values of the core values of the internet. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your question. There are a couple of others who have three questions, and three will come in the next round. Let's go. Who would like to take the questions? Who would like to start with? Incentives for countries to confirm. How difficult it is to develop the norms, I can tell you, very difficult. We are having negotiations face to face. We are having online discussions for months, and not everyone is happy with the text. I can tell you that. But, but at some point, we just have to finish elaborating, and at some point, we have to introduce something, and that's why we are open for comments. And the protection of core values. So, who would like to start? Incentives. Incentives. Wolfgang, please. Um, one question back. Why please. IFCs adopted by the IF, IETF are respected by everybody? Because it's in the interest of everybody. That means if somebody ignores an IFC, so it works against him or herself. And I think this is the, um, the trick of the norms, that we try to formulate the norms, that it's in the inter interest of everybody uh, to respect the norm. Otherwise, it would the person or the state or the non-state actor would punish him or herself. Um, you know, that's the hope. Reality is different. You have always bad guys in so far, you know, what uh, Olivier said, you know, how to police this. Uh, it needs a system, probably an organized system of naming and shaming, and to reduce the number of bad guys. You cannot exclude them, it will continue, so it's a permanent struggle. But the main incentive is really the universal nature of the norms. Yeah, and I, I, I build on that and say that, I build on that and say that, you know, first the, a question from the gentleman from ICANN, or the observation, we still have to get people to accept these norms, right? And it's the same for the norms that came out of the group of governmental experts in the UN. These are not universally accepted, so there's a lot of work to do, and this goes to Jan's point, uh, making sure that we embed these in other frameworks, that we talk to other stakeholders, that this is acceptable to various government groups too. That goes to the incentive point, and it's interesting that you're not going to get governments or other parties to agree to norms that they don't, they're not in their best interest in the long term. So how do we create incentives to not disrupt, but incentives to cooperate in cyberspace to help reach that equilibrium? Uh, they have to be in their best interest, but then it also goes to something that we said that we need an accountability framework, and, and that's a hard issue too. Naming and shaming, in my view, there are some parties that can't be named and shamed, so you have to look at the full tools, how you do that. So, uh, and the last thing, just to, to your point about uh, do we avoid questions about um, you know, differences in opinions on things? Well, no, but I think a lot of these things do transcend that. And of course, we do keep the core values, the last gentleman's point, in mind as we look at all of these things. We all look at the core values. That's not stability per se, but it's something that informs our work just more generally. Thank you for the questions. I think, you know, the, the notion of uh, uh, the heated discussions that we're having uh, really also says something about how serious we are about being multi-stakeholder because we among ourselves are kind of like a summary and um, like a mini ecosystem of different stakeholders not everyone of course but I think those discussions already balance out some of the very different starting points and, and interests that are also uh, to be found globally uh, in society so I was just thinking Maybe uh, we shouldn't try to be a norms factory, but it sometimes does feel like a sweatshop uh, the way we're working. And as such, we have permanent links with other initiatives in society, with um, you know legislation, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, with corporate interests, with uh, global uh, variation in perspective. I mean, when you sit in uh, Asia, you may have a different view of the world uh, than when you sit uh, in a developing country in Africa, for example, or uh, when you sit in the heart of Europe. I mean, it, it, it's a global internet and we want to keep it that way. And I think that that is a core value that we share, to keep the internet open. And that may sound super obvious for this audience, but of course, you all are not our primary audience necessarily. It's also a matter of linking the technological communities and the, the more you know, security-oriented, national security, national policy, political audiences out there who may not be thinking about the importance of the open internet every day, who may not be from you know, Canada or Estonia, uh, to name two uh, interestingly combined examples. Um, but it's difficult sometimes, and 
if we cannot articulate, um, for example, liberal democratic values as the inspiration, sometimes we, we indeed, as Wolfgang said, come to a common denominator. Uh, and that's why you also see that the norms are, I think they are formulated in a minimalistic way, but every word has been thought about. I think it's important that you all feel how much work goes into compressing a lot of thinking and research that comes and, and people that share their expertise before us as a commission and then sort of boil it down literally to a number of sentences with the hope that that indeed is an entry point for multiple stakeholders. And again, we don't claim to have the perfect answers, but we aim to create gravity about which, around which people can can come together and, you know, the norm then starts to live a life of its own, gets reflected in legislation globally or gets referenced by academics or is a space where civil society can rally around and say, hey, we want to support this norm and we actually think this is worth pushing for and we're going to hold to account people who don't respect this norm. And that's when, you know, you get gravity of people clustering around an idea, essentially, and that's what we hope to do. So these two questions are actually interconnected more than you might think. Um, there's been a lot of use of the word factory, uh, the notion of authorship, and I think that if I felt like I had authored anything here, I would feel that I had failed. I feel like when we are doing our job correctly, we are anthropologists. We are documenting the shared understanding of most of the world. Right? The documents that we're writing down are the least common denominator that just about everybody can completely agree to. Right? Not everybody, everybody, because that's what failed in the UN. Right? When everybody, everybody can be there and veto, then you don't actually come to agreement, at least not in the current environment. So since Chris hates it when I use the United States as an example of a miscreant, uh, I'll pick on some of the Internet's friends um, to, to address why this is important um, with regard to enforcement. We don't have enforcement of a norm because the norm is just a documented understanding of what most people agree to. It's not a treaty, right? So another example, not in the Internet space, is whaling. The enforcement of whaling is that any time Japan, Iceland, or Norway are trying to get anything else done, it's a little bit more expensive for them diplomatically because people will say, oh, sure, international banking, this and that, but what about those whales, right? So ideally, we would get to the point where these norms are uh, documenting an important enough understanding of how the world needs to work that any time the US, Russia, or China tried to do anything, everybody else would say, yeah, well, sure, but what about the internet? Um, so that's where we hope that things will wind up. We hope that these documents are clear enough that most of the world can look at them and recognize their own interests represented in these words and say, yeah, that's us. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and be short. Uh, you, you asked the question, why is the, the, the underlying values of the core not documented? And I, I was like, yeah, why didn't we do that? Or did we actually do that? So I, I quickly looked up, and if you look at the public core of the Internet document, its first paragraph says, the Internet has changed the world, fueling political, economic, and social growth. More generally, cyberspace promotes communication, commerce, education, human rights, and livelihood on every level. To continue this progress, we believe that the stability of cyberspace is essential for the good of humanity now and to the future. Those are the abilities that the Internet brings. We have not documented as such what are the values or the, the what is that openness and permissionless innovation and so on that at the Internet Society we always talk about. That's not what we documented. What we did document was the positive attributes that the Internet brings to humanity. And I think that is, uh, that is something where everybody gets, can get behind. Was that 30 seconds? <laughs> not, not, yeah, not really. 
we have nine minutes. We have four interventions, and then I'll ask commissioners very briefly to reflect on them. Gentlemen, gentlemen, lady, lady. Gender balance. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hans Klein. I'm on the faculty of Georgia Tech and currently on the faculty of Princeton University. Uh, so I have, uh, I'm kind of coming up to speed on the work that you have been doing for a while, so my question may be a little bit basic. Uh, and I think the work you're doing is terrific and very important. Um, but I see, I'm having trouble seeing the forest for the trees. I, I see the norms, uh, each one makes sense. It's, I'm having difficulty seeing sort of clusters of them. So I, I'm wondering, are there, uh, it, I'm seeing a consensus, but is there, are there some overarching philosophical differences out there? Are there some uh, big uh, philosophical differences that you had to navigate that would help me understand uh, the terrain in which you're operating? I, I know that, for instance, um, the, the GGE, there is a divergence, I guess I heard, the position of Cuba and others, there was a split there. Uh, I talked to Veni Markovsky was telling me today about the Russian and the U.S. introduction of various proposals in the context of the United Nations. So I'm wondering, can you tell me a little bit about uh, some of the big pictures, constellations, philosophical differences that are perhaps overarching the many specific norms that you've presented here? And kind of related to that, um, is your commission uh, would you say that you're a globally representative group or maybe I see more, is this a, a consensus among folks in the West and is there an East-West split and maybe you're, you, you have one perspective on that. I don't see anybody in China, for instance. So if you'd help me on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentleman over there, please. Uh, good afternoon, Paul Wilson from uh, APNEC. I, I was in uh, Wuzhen last week the, at the World uh, Internet Conference and the um, uh, the reference in Norm 7 to sovereignty uh, sort of reminded me of the repeated uh, use of the word cyber sovereignty in that, um, in that context, which has been uh, discussed for some years now. Um, as a member of the high-level advisory uh, committee, I was given the chance to sort of look at the, the next draft Wujian outlook, and it was suggested there that cyber, cyber sovereignty is a concept that has been accepted by numerous, um, numerous countries. And I actually questioned that, and I, I felt that you know, cyber sovereignty within this document really was ill-defined, and we couldn't, we really couldn't say that a concept that had just been ref referenced, albeit so many times, was was well accepted. And I sort of tried to uh, suggest that maybe we were still exploring cyber sovereignty. And that was about uh, about as much as I could do in that in that con in that context. But my sort of suggestion here or question is whether that term itself could be. Uh, kind of uh, used, uh, occupied uh, in, in the work that you're doing to try and actually find some uh, closer agreement uh, or some, some stated definition somewhere of what cyber sovereignty might actually mean in a, in a, in a useful way uh, because I really think that's been given a huge amount of importance in Wujian and it's sort of being left to be uh, sort of referenced and used in a way that I think we could probably help to give it some, uh, give it some more clarity. Thanks. Thank you. Lady over there, at Lady over there. Thank you. My name is Melinda Clem. I'm with Affilius. My question is about the interaction of the norms, and if you've, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. my question is about the interaction of the norms, and if you've identified any sort of play in terms of how specific recommendations might be prioritized. So, by example, uh, well into the future, if we've made enough progress uh, mitigating significant vulnerabilities and protecting the public core of the internet, might that lead to a recommendation of moving more infrastructure and systems um, in the, our electoral process online? Thank you. And unfortunately, that's the last question because we can't go into Macron's presentation, President Macron's presentation. Please. Annette Mühlberg from UA Law and the Trade Union Verdi. Um, Thank you for this really important initiative and um, I like the spirit to reduce the number of bad guys but at the same time I don't really believe that we will fully um, uh, fulfill this aim. So um, I'm wondering if, if um, one part of this declaration should not also be something where are the limits of IT. Um, for the public value and the public core infrastructures, I think we should discuss if electoral 
uh, infrastructure is really a useful infrastructure or, or this should be just say analog. I would prefer that. Um, we should also discuss um, uh, critical infrastructure like water supply and things like this. Should there be something like an analog backup structure at least so that we get along at least for some hours or at hopefully days? Um, we, we have to think about a good combination and this might sometimes not be in the interest of IT companies but it should be certainly in the interest of states to really discuss this and uh, I think it should be part of the norm discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. I'll start with the answers and then I'll look at my colleagues. First of all, uh, big picture, there is a huge ideological division. I was twice in the panel of the UN experts and the ideological division is there. Countries who see the benefits, see also challenges and benefits, like-minded countries. On the other side, countries who see the use of ICT as a way of interfering into the domestic affairs, starting colored revolutions, brainwashing their citizens. The ideological division is there. That's the real situation in the United Nations and result of that uh, ideological division are those two resolutions that were passed last Thursday, Friday in the United Nations. Are we geographically representative? I would say yes, because we have commissioners from Berkeley to Beijing, from Thailand to Johannesburg. So yes, we are. Uh, we are a political organization. That's why we're not discussing information operations. We're not discussing democratic elections. We're not discuss discussing state sovereignty. We're not discussing political questions. We are a political institution. Which norms will be priorita prioritized? It depends on you. We are proposing, and now it's very much depends on those who will either support, make amendments, recommendations. It's now up to international community, everybody. Governments, industry, civil society, academia, IT institutions, startups, whoever, to support us. And then we can see which norms are gathering more attention and which norms will be more important than the other ones. And as to the limits of discussions, happy to discuss water supplies, but our mandate is work a global commission on the stability of cyberspace. And we are operating in the field of peace and security and cyberspace. So that's our mandate. And now colleagues, please, who would like to jump in? We have two minutes. And I'll, I'll jump in quickly, Chris, in just responding to Hans. I think one of the, for us as a commission, one of the challenges is do we develop norms that are very aspirational? I mean, none of us want the internet to be used in any way for, for, to create harm, for attack. So that was, or do we develop norms that respond to reality, that acknowledges that in fact states are developing cyber um, attack capacities? And how do we have norms that actually can operate in the real world, world situation, as well as still make a significant value statement? about the importance of not harming the internet, particularly the public. So I think that's one of our big pic picture concerns that we, that we have to navigate. I think similarly the notion of sovereignty, um, and, and I think Paul's right that that needs to be discussed more. And then finally, I think one of our big picture issues as well, and I think that's what makes us different from many other initiatives like the recommendations from the GGE, is we are addressing state and non-state actors. And you'll see that some of our norms only address state, some address non-state, some address state and non-state. That's different, I think. That's a, that's a different way of thinking about norms. But at a big picture level, that's also quite challenging. Yeah, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to come back to the uh, whole sovereignty issue uh, because I think, uh, of course, states have very different perspectives on what sovereignty means in the digital space and there are many challenges to state sovereignty and to the ability to exercise sovereign powers uh, in the digital space. And of course, the question is more acute by, uh, for states who feel threatened by uh, in their ability uh, to maintain the stability of their regime um, than in states where, uh, that have the supremacy of uh, various dimensions of cyberspace. Now, with regards to your commission, I think we recognize that international law applies to cyberspace and that our system uh, is, in our international system of peace and security is still based on the principle of 
state sovereignty. So it's really with regards with states' rights and duties uh, that we use the term uh, sovereignty, and a lot of our norms are grounded in uh, the principles of uh, state. So I mean, of international law. And um, just to go back, and uh, this person is gone. Oh, no, they're here. Um, the overarching uh, differences, I think, and that's what I wanted to answer to the first questions, I think it's more the overarching agreement that we really work for uh, the stability of cyberspace. And the, we, we discussed whether we're um, defending the public core as a, an infrastructure or the core values. But uh, in the end, what we want to defend is the ability to do whatever we do that relies on cyberspace and on what the internet provides to us. And uh, uh, whatever we want to call it, it's what we want is to preserve enough stability so that we can continue uh, to develop our activities over um, the internet. So very quickly, we're not trying to we're not trying to boil the ocean. There's lots of other activities, lots of other initiatives out there dealing with lots of different parts of cyberspace. Uh, we are trying to focus the stability on the stability issue and bring new voices to that debate. Uh, and the second thing I'd say is, I don't dislike the norms. I'm I'm happy with the norms, but the norms are only part of the larger framework. So our work is going to be turning to some of those recommendations, those principles, that framework. We look forward to your input in that, and I'll stop there. Dear colleagues. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It was very useful. You, you will receive the norms. Please be in touch with us. And I think after this warm-up, we are ready to listen to President of France. Thank you.